Section 20 of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Why Do We Need a Public Library? By Various. Section 20 The Free Public Library. Thomas Wentworth Higginson the public library had now passed the period of the merely academic advocacy exemplified in the tickner letter of eighteen fifty one it was an actual functioning institution and as such was called upon to answer criticism and to justify its existence the atmosphere of apologetics begins to appear in what its friends have to say about it this is evident in the extract of colonel higginson's men and women new york eighteen eighty eight which immediately follows the author's comparison of the evolution of a library with that of a great railroad system is perhaps the first hint of a comprehensive vision of the library as something bigger than any individual town or city institution and beyond it thomas wentworth higginson was born in cambridge massachusetts december twenty two eighteen twenty three and graduated at harvard in eighteen forty one he entered the ministry in 1847, but retired in 1848, and served in the Civil War. From that time until his death, May 9, 1911, he devoted himself to literature, of publishing a large number of books. Just as there is a good deal of anxiety wasted in regard to our free public schools, especially on the part of those who have never entered them, so there is some misplaced solicitude in regard to our libraries the free town or city library is one of the few things in our democratic society that would have pleased the splenetic carlyle who mourned in one of his early letters that every village in england had its jail but none its open library it is a pity therefore when a man of high standing and great influence writes of these institutions thus hastily i take the passage from a well-known literary journal among the forms of beneficence for which our own generation has been conspicuous is the free library but it is i apprehend no exaggeration to say that such well-meant generosity has oftener than otherwise the italics are my own been chilled and discouraged by its results appreciative readers are few the best books are largely let alone and the cost of the plant and the taste which are put into it are often in most painful contrast to the appreciation which they have received now while every count of this last sentence may be true in dictment it is easy to show how little it sustains the verdict appreciative readers are few in the most cultivated circles if their appreciation must be tested by the best books only it is not easy even to know what the best books are, if we may judge by the tiresome failures in making out the list of them. And suppose that they were known. Do we find many clergymen or bishops who habitually read Plato, Aeschylus, and Dante, rather than Ben-Hur, or The Lady and the Tiger? It does not, therefore, follow that people are unworthy of public libraries, because the best books are largely let alone. The question is whether even the second best may not be good reading. We have the medical authority of Hippocrates for saying that the second best medicine may be better than the best, if the patient likes it best. So in regard to the fine buildings, the success of Republican government happily does not depend on how far our citizens appreciate the architecture of the Capitol at Washington and the State House at Albany and it is surely the same with libraries grant a few overfine library buildings built to please some private benefactor grant a few mismanaged public libraries though where these buildings or these libraries are i do not myself know does the kindly writer of these lines mean to be understood as saying that oftener than otherwise our free public libraries are failures if he does it can only be said that this remark adds another to the innumerable illustrations 
of that invaluable remark of coldridge that we must take every man's testimony to the value of that which he does not know all experience shows how easy it is to construct an institution out of one's own consciousness and then condemn it we see this daily in what is written of our public school system in general butler's brief career as governor of massachusetts he made a severe attack upon the normal art school in boston and cited a pathetic instance of a fallen girl who undoubtedly as he urged received her first demoralization from the study of the nude in that school it turned out on investigation that he himself had never entered the school and that the young girl herself made no such charges that there never had been any studying from nude models in the school that she had attended it but a month or two and this in its early days when it did not possess so much of a plaster cast of a human foot or hand no matter the charge was reiterated up to the very end of his excellency's career in office and is believed by many worthy people of this day it is equally easy to bring general charges against public libraries and equally hard to remove their impression however unjust and even cruel they may be what are the facts there has just been a great librarians convention assembled from all parts of the country and keeping together for many days did a single speaker at that convention take the ground that oftener than otherwise the benefactors of public libraries were chilled and discouraged on the contrary it was reported that such benefactors were never so active and their benefactions were never so large the tone was not one of discouragement but of buoyancy and hope every one admitted the vastness of the educational engine created by the free library system every one had his own suggestion by the way of improvement or development but every one expressed a cordial faith in the community and reported encouragement in all work well done the simple truth is that the creation of a system of such libraries is like the creation of a great railway system it must be an evolution not a creation outright the wisest librarian in america fifty years ago had no more conception of the free library system of today than had benjamin franklin of our postal methods nor can anyone now foresee what fifty years of development will do for either the truth is that every step in any great organization brings out new possibilities new dangers and new resources side by side with the perils of free libraries as of too much light reading and the absence of proper appreciation of the best things there are evoked resources to meet these dangers outside the library there comes up the association to promote study at home and the vast chautauqua reading circles all these being essentially based on the free library system and implying it for their full development inside the library there grow up such methods as those of the mr s s green city librarian of worcester massachusetts whose ways of making such an institution useful to all sorts and conditions of the people may take rank with roland hill's improvement in postal service as to their results on democratic civilization he has succeeded in linking the library and the public schools so closely that he and the teachers acting in concurrence indirectly control the reading of the whole generation that is growing up in that city the details must be sought in his reports as for instance one from the library journal of march eighteen eighty seven which is printed as a leaflet but the essential thing in managing libraries as in managing schools is to have faith in the community in which one lives and to believe that people do as the scripture has it covet earnestly the best gifts if you only show them how those best gifts are to be obtained put into school and library methods one half the organizing ability brought to bear on railways and telegraphs and we shall stand astonished at the results within our reach those already attained if fairly looked at are sufficient to encourage anyone the writer has had two different times and in two different states been a director in these institutions whenever he needed a little stimulus toward doing his duty 
it was his custom to go and look over the rack containing the books lately brought back by readers with all necessary deduction for the love of fiction a love shared in these days by the wisest and best the proportion of sensible and useful reading was always such as to vindicate the immense value of the free public libraries End of section 20section 21 of why do we need a public library this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana why do we need a public library by various section 21 some popular objections to public libraries by frederick poole introduction this is probably the first treatment of the subject in this country and is the leading article in the second number of the american library journal as it was then called the writer william f poole was at the time librarian of the chicago public library he mentioned objections only to explain them away it will be noted that none of them would be described at present as popular and that only the third is now much heard william frederick poole was born in salem massachusetts in eighteen twenty one and graduated at yale in eighteen forty nine where as librarian of the lenonian and brothers library he founded poole's index to periodical literature by which his name is chiefly remembered he was librarian of the chicago public library in eighteen seventy three through eighty seven and at his death march first eighteen ninety four he was librarian of the newberry library chicago whose building he designed on the departmental system of which he was an earnest advocate he was the second president of the american library association serving in eighteen eighty five through eighty seven and now mr frederick poole in this paper i shall use the term public libraries as meaning free municipal libraries organized under state laws and supported by general taxation this definition will exclude from our notice a large number of libraries established on other foundations some of them richly endowed and partially accessible to the public the rapid increase in the number and importance of public libraries both in this country and in england is perhaps the most marked feature of educational development during the past twenty-five years for within that brief period the first of them was opened to the public my subject as announced in the program requires me to speak of popular objections yet i must confess that popular appreciation of these institutions where they have been established would have furnished a more attractive theme as their foundation involves taxation that prolific source of political controversy it is somewhat remarkable that in the eleven states of our union where public library statutes have been enacted so little public discussion has occurred and so few objections have been offered i have heard of no instance where such a bill was proposed in a state legislature and was defeated that all the northern states where general education and the common school system are established have not by legislation provided also for the public library the natural ally and supplement of that system is doubtless owing to the fact that the people have not asked for such legislation the unanimity of the vote by which towns have accepted taxation for the support of public libraries is significant the commissioner of education at washington recently made inquiries on this point and received replies from thirty-seven towns and cities in thirty-two of these the vote was unanimous in five there was a divided sentiment but the vote was seventeen hundred and thirty in favor to five hundred and fifteen against taxation the vote of the ratepayers in some english towns and cities where free libraries have been established was as follows the eyes versus the nose manchester three thousand nine hundred and sixty two to forty winchester three thirty seven to thirteen bolton six sixty two to fifty five cambridge eight seventy three to seventy eight oxford five ninety six to seventy two 
Sheffield, 838 to 232. Kinderminster, 108 to 11. Blackburn, 1700 to 2. Dundee, no dissentient. By the latest statistics of the Bureau of Education, it appears that there are 188 public libraries in 11 of the United States. Of these, five are eastern states, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Five are western states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa, and one is a southern state, Texas. Eight of these states have passed public library statutes within the past ten years. In the number of libraries, the states rank as follows. Massachusetts, 127. Illinois, 14. New Hampshire, 13. Ohio, 9. Maine, 8. Vermont, Connecticut, and Wisconsin, 4 each. Indiana, 3. Iowa and Texas, 1 each. In the number of volumes, they rank as follows in round numbers. Massachusetts, 920,000. Ohio, 144,000. Illinois, 77,000. New Hampshire, 52,000. Maine, 34,000. Indiana, 26,000. Vermont, 16,000. Connecticut, 15,000. Texas, 10,000. Wisconsin, 6,000. Iowa, 1,000. The aggregate number of volumes in these libraries is 1,300,000, and their annual aggregate circulation is 4,735,000 volumes. It is noticeable that no one of these libraries is in New York, Pennsylvania, or any of the middle states. The representatives from those states in this conference may be able to account for this hiatus in the statistics of the Bureau of Education. In this brief sketch of the statistics of our American public libraries, we have not found much evidence of popular objections to their inception and organization. In England, however, where the question of national schools, secular schools, and parochial schools are still mooted, the idea of levying a general tax for the support of a library free to all and furnished with books adapted to the capacities of all classes was not in harmony with the traditions and public policy of that people. In 1848, the same year that the legislature of Massachusetts, at the suggestion of Josiah Quincy, mayor of Boston, passed an act authorizing the city of Boston to maintain a public library. Mr. William Ewart, Member of Parliament, moved in the House of Commons for a committee of inquiry respecting libraries. Such a committee was raised, and Mr. Ewart was appointed chairman. Much evidence was taken, a report was made, and in February 1850, a bill was introduced into the House of Commons enabling town councils to establish public libraries and museums. Quote, Our younger brethren, the people of the United States, says the report, have already anticipated us in the formation of libraries entirely open to the public. End quote. The bill proposed limited the rate of taxation to one half penny in the pound, required an affirmative vote of two-thirds of the ratepayers, restricted its operation to towns which had at least 10,000 inhabitants, and provided that the money so raised should be expended only in building and contingent expenses. This bill, meager indeed compared with the later enactments of Parliament, met persistent opposition from the conservative benches. An ex-chancellor of the exchequer objected because it did not give sufficient powers to form a library, and he should object more strongly to it if it did. Who was to select the books? Was every publication that issued from the press to be procured, or was there to be a censorship introduced? Another member claimed that the bill would enable a few persons to tax the general body of ratepayers for their own benefit, and the library would degenerate into a political club. Colonel Sibthorpe thought that, however excellent food for the mind might be, food for the body was more needed by the people. I do not like reading at all, he said, and hated it when I was at Oxford. Lord John Manners said he could not support the bill because it would impose an additional tax upon the agricultural interest. 
mr spooner feared these institutions might be converted into normal schools of agitation sir roundell palmer since the lord chancellor of england was most apprehensive that the moment the compulsory principle was introduced a positive check would be imposed upon the voluntary self-supporting desire which existed among the people a division being taken on the bill there were one hundred and eighteen eyes and one hundred and one noes the bill passed the house of commons in july and the house of lords without opposition in august eighteen fifty the manchester liverpool and bolton free libraries were immediately organized under this act the cost of the books being defrayed by public subscription in eighteen fifty three similar legislation was extended to scotland and ireland in july eighteen fifty five the new libraries having gone into operation with the most encouraging results a new and more liberal library act was passed by a vote of three to one which raised the rate of taxation from a halfpenny to a penny in the pound and allowed the income to be expended for books its provisions were made to include towns boroughs parishes and districts having a population of five thousand inhabitants and permitting two adjoining parishes having an aggregate population of five thousand to unite in the establishment of a library in eighteen sixty six the library act was again improved by removing the limit of population required and reducing the two-thirds vote on the acceptance of the library tax to a bare majority vote provision was also made for cases in which the overseers of parishes refused or neglected to call a meeting of the ratepayers to vote on the question any ten ratepayers could secure the calling of such a meeting and the vote there taken was made binding and legal the english free library system is now so firmly established that it will not be changed except to expand and enlarge it its chief supporters are the middle classes the artisans and laborers who with their families are its most numerous patrons the recent extension of suffrage in england has strengthened the system no candidate for official position who opposed it could hope for success it has been found that free libraries have not degenerated into political clubs and schools of agitation no trouble has arisen in the selection of books and no censorship of the press was required it was at first supposed that all books relating to religion and politics the subjects on which people quarrel most must be excluded the experiment of including these books was tried in the manchester and liverpool libraries where the books were purchased by private subscription and no controversy arising therefrom all apprehension of evil from this cause was allayed parliament doubled the rate of taxation and permitted the purchase of books from the public funds the adoption of the compulsory system has not imposed a check on the voluntary and self-supporting desire of possessing books which existed among the people it has strengthened that desire and ample proof of this statement could be furnished if the prescribed limits of this paper would permit it is singular that objections to public libraries have come mainly from men as we have seen from the debate in the british parliament who are educated and in general matters of public welfare are intelligent above their fellows these objections however were uttered before the persons making them had given the subject any attention and hence they were disqualified from entertaining an opinion nearly all the objections to public libraries which have been expressed in this country and these appear more frequently in private conversation than in public prints, may be classed under three heads. 1. The universal dread of taxation. Libraries cost money. In every city and town of the land there is a feeling that the present rate of taxation is all that the property and business of the place will bear. This feeling existed before the taxes were one-half of their present rates there is a generous rivalry among our cities and towns in the maintenance of good schools and localities which furnish the best facilities for education are regarded as the most desirable places for residence viewed simply as a matter of public economy no city can afford to dispense with its educational system or to permit it to degenerate 
the public library also should be maintained as the supplement of the public school carrying forward the education of the people from the point where the public school leaves it two there are certain theoretical objections offered to the establishment and maintenance of public libraries one is that the library tax bears unequally upon the people some persons do not care to read books and others prefer to pay for their own reading the same objection is quite as valid against any system of public education to lay the burden of education uniformly upon property and to tax the owner who has no children or having children prefers to educate them at private schools is another glaring instance of inequality no taxation for the maintenance of public health the introduction of water and gas the construction of roads bridges and sewers bears equally upon every member of the community if perfect equality in the distribution of these burdens were a necessity an organized municipality would be an impossibility perhaps the most popular objection to public libraries is the one urged by the few disciples of herbert spencer that government has no legitimate function except the protection of person and property as the original compact of society is simply for the purpose of protection all else is paternal pertains to the commune and tends to perpetual antagonism the government may support a police courts of justice prisons penitentiaries and similar institutions and can do nothing else how are the people under this theory to be educated the reply is explicit unless they will educate themselves they are not to be educated how is the public health to be maintained it is not to be maintained by any interference of government who is to build bridges and sewers and lay out public parks nobody imagine if it be possible a community where such a utopian theory was carried out such a government fortunately does not and never did exist on the face of the globe the general welfare which includes protection is expressly stated in the preamble of the national constitution to be the purpose of our government and the same expression is found in nearly all the state constitutions whatever the people desire and whatever will in their judgment conduce to the general welfare is a legitimate subject for government action the only orthodox object of the institution of government says mr jefferson is to secure the greatest degree of happiness possible to the general mass of those associated under it herbert spencer wrote his social statics before the british parliament passed an act for the support of public libraries mr ewart's bill was then before parliament and mr spencer in that work took occasion to fling a sneer at it in the preface of his american edition written in eighteen sixty four he states without remodelling the text that quote, the work does not accurately represent his present opinions end quote. three the third and last class of objections to public libraries to which i shall direct your attention relates to the kind and quality of books circulated these objections which are usually made by educated and scholarly persons are based on an entire misconception of the facts in the case the objectors do not divest themselves of the old idea that libraries are established for the exclusive benefit of scholars whereas the purpose of these is to furnish reading for all classes in the community on no other principle would a general tax for their support be justifiable the masses of a community have very little of literary and scholarly culture they need more of this culture and the purpose of the library is to develop and increase it this is done by placing in their hands such books as they can read with pleasure and appreciate and by stimulating them to acquire the habit of reading we must first interest the reader before we can educate him and to this end must commence at his own standard of intelligence the scholar in his pride of intellect forgets the progressive steps he took in his own mental development the stories read by him in the nursery the boy's book of adventure in which he reveled with delight and the sentimental novel over which he shed tears in his youth our objector supposes that the masses will read books of his standard if they were not supplied with the books to which he objects but he is mistaken shut up to this choice they will read no books 
when the habit of reading is once acquired the reader's taste and hence the quality of his reading progressively improves the standard histories technical works of science and even shakespeare's plays and milton's paradise lost are sealed books to a large portion of every community then are willing to acknowledge the fact when a boy said john quincy adams i attempted ten times to read milton's paradise lost i was mortified even to the shedding of tears that i could not conceive what it was that my father and mother so much admired in that book i smoked tobacco and read milton at the same time and for the same motive to find out what was the recondite charm in them that gave my father so much pleasure after making myself sick four or five times with smoking i mastered that accomplishment but i did not master milton i was nearly thirty years of age when i first read paradise lost with delight and astonishment if our objectors mourn over the standard of books which are read by the public they may be consoled by the fact that as a rule people read books better than themselves and hence are benefited by reading a book of a lower intellectual or moral standard than the readers is thrown aside in disgust to be picked up and read by a person still lower in the scale of mental and moral development i do not lament or join in the clamour sometimes raised over the statistics of prose fiction circulated at public libraries why this lamentation over one specific form of fiction the writers of such prose fiction as is found in our libraries were as eminent and worthy men and women as the writers of poetical fiction dramatic fiction or i might add the fiction which passed in the world as history and biography history professes to relate actual events biography to describe actual lives and science to unfold and explain natural laws and physical phenomena fiction treats these and other subjects mental moral sentimental and divine from an ideal or artistic standpoint and the great mass of readers prefer to take their knowledge in this form more is known to-day of the history and traditions of scotland and of the social customs of london from the novels of sir walter scott and charles dickens than from all the histories of those localities fiction is the art element in literature and the most enduring monuments of genius in the literature of any people are works of the imagination it is said that there is much poor fiction and the statement is true so there are many poor pictures and poor statues wretched chromos and more wretched plaster casts that these productions find purchasers is evidence that there are persons whose ideal standard of excellence is even below these feeble efforts and they are educated thereby but there are novels we are told which are immoral and positively debasing so there are immoral paintings and indecent plastic objects the act of photography i am told is debased to the lowest purposes nobody would think of objecting to art because it can be and is degraded the librarian who should allow an immoral novel in his library for circulation would be as culpable as the manager of a picture gallery who should hang an indecent picture on his walls young people again we are told read too many novels so they eat too much play too much go too often to the lake to bathe remain too long in the water and do too much of everything in which they take special delight the remedy is not to deprive children of these pleasures but that parents and guardians should regulate them i have never met a person of much literary culture who would not confess that at some period in his life usually in his youth he had read novels excessively his special interest in them suddenly ceased he found himself with a confirmed habit of reading an awakened imagination a full vocabulary and a taste for other and higher classes of literature a novel was read occasionally in later life as recreation in the midst of professional or technical studies my observation addressed to this point and extending over a library experience of thirty years has confirmed me in the belief that there is in the mental development of every person who later attains a literary culture a limited period where he craves novel reading and perhaps reads novels to excess but from which if the desire be gratified he passes safely out into broader fields of study and this craving never returns to him in its original form 
again and finally we are told that the reading of fiction should be discouraged because it is not true what department of literature is true is it history whose history of the united states for instance is the true history is it bancroft's mr bancroft for forty years has been changing the plates of his work to an extent that in pages we can scarcely recognize the original text and lately he has revised the whole in the new centennial edition the accurate student of specialties in american history will talk to you by the hour of misstatements and errors found in this new issue whose history of the reigns of henry the eighth and of queen elizabeth is the true one is it hume's turner's lingard's or froude's do not read to me history said a sick monarch that i know is a lie read to me something that is true is biography true which of the scores of lives of mary queen of scots is the true biography is theology true whose is the true body of divinity is science true why was it necessary to rewrite all the science in the eighth edition of the encyclopedia britannica for the ninth edition homer's iliad dante's divine comedy shakespeare's hamlet and othello do not require to be rewritten every ten or twenty years the vicar of wakefield ivanhoe and robinson crusoe have held and will hold their own from generation to generation without revision because they are ideally true pictures of human life and human nature shall we say that in literature and science there is nothing true but fiction and the pure mathematics in the public libraries which are growing up in our land fully four-fifths of the money appropriated for books is spent in works adapted to the wants of scholars in the larger libraries the proportion is even greater it is hardly becoming for scholars who enjoy the lion's share to object to the small proportional expenditure for books adapted to the wants of the masses who bear the burden of taxation mr edward edwards of the manchester library speaking in eighteen fifty nine of novels and romances which he circulated more freely than is done in any american library remarked as follows it may be truthfully said that at no previous period in the history of english literature has prose fiction been made in so great a degree as of late the vehicle of the best thoughts of some of the best thinkers nor taking it as a whole was it ever before characterized by so much general purity of tone or loftiness of purpose end of section twenty one some popular objections to public libraries section twenty two of why do we need a public library this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana why do we need a public library by various authors section twenty two the function of a town library by josiah p quincy introductory note by arthur bostwich while asserting his belief in making a library popular the writer denies that his belief justifies the inclusion of fiction his position seems to be that praiseworthy as much of it is fiction should not be supplied to the public from the public funds the present attitude that this is a matter to be settled by the public itself is repudiated in set terms and with somewhat picturesque illustrations by mr quincy his stalwart advocacy of the library as a supplement to the school is what justifies the inclusion of his paper in this collection josiah phillips quincy was born in boston november twenty eighth eighteen twenty nine and graduated at harvard in eighteen fifty the son of the statesman josiah quincy who was also president of harvard he was admitted to the bar in eighteen fifty four but afterward engaged in business and in farming also writing freely on civic and economic subjects and now the function of a town library by josiah p quincy this is a one-sided paper something might be said on the other side 
but as this is the popular side it is likely to receive full justice in behalf of an unconverted minority who should be represented through the press if nowhere else i desire to register a dissent from the prevailing opinion concerning the function of libraries sustained by the taxation of towns and small municipalities the importance of stimulating thought upon subjects bearing ever so remotely upon our fiscal requirements i conceive to be far greater than may superficially appear for when the mass of our people clearly comprehend what government should not be called upon to do for them they will insist upon its performing duties which are manifestly within its sphere of action laboring men and women are to-day suffering from the adulteration of their food and drink and from a system of taxation which oppresses them with weighty and unjust burdens their deliverance can only come by dismissing legislators who are disciples of what may be called the todgers school of economy that remarkable matron as dickens tells us caring little for the solid sustenance of her boarders provided the gravy was abundant and satisfactory upon what principle can the citizen who thinks before he casts his ballot justify himself in voting increased taxes upon his neighbors for the purpose of establishing a library he must assume the necessity of public schools and then argue that he may vote for a library that will supplement the elementary instruction which the town provides and the justification is ample if our schools are so conducted as to waken a taste for knowledge and give a correct method in english reading the town library may represent the university brought to every man's door but suppose a large portion of the funds taken from taxpayers is devoted to circulating ephemeral works of mere amusement is it not as monstrous for me to vote to tax my neighbor to furnish the boys and girls with a terrible tribulation or lady so-and-so's struggle as it would be for the purpose of providing them with free tickets to witness article forty seven or the black crook these romances and dramas to represent them in the most favorable point of view are evanescent productions designed to meet the market demand for the intense and spasmodic their claims to patronage from the public purse are precisely similar so far the citizen has a right to object as a taxpayer but if he were truly solicitous for the welfare of the community about him the protest might be far deeper for the weak spot in our school system lies just here while claiming immense credit for giving most of our children the ability to read we show the profoundest indifference about what they read but this accomplishment of reading is a very doubtful good if it goes no farther than to give a boy the satisfaction of perusing the police gazette or introduces a girl to the immoralities of mr griffith gaunt and the adventures of a hundred other heroes of characters even more questionable by teaching our children to read and then setting them adrift in a sea of feverish literature which vitiates the taste and enervates the character we show an indifference about as sensible as that of the old lady who thought it could not matter whether her son had gone to the bosom of abraham or beelzebub seeing they were both scripture names it is not difficult to conceive of communities existing in greenland or elsewhere which might legitimately tax the citizen to furnish his neighbors with their novel reading but it can scarcely be disputed that an increased facility for obtaining works of fiction is not the pressing need of our country in this present year of grace dr isaac ray perhaps our highest authority on morbid mental phenomena concludes his study on the effects of the prevalent romantic literature in these words quote, the specific doctrine i would inculcate is that the excessive indulgence in novel reading which is a characteristic of our times is chargeable with many of the mental irregularities that prevail among us in a degree unknown at any former period End quote the late dr forbes winslow a physician of similar note in england used still stronger language in describing how fearfully and fatally suggestive to the minds of the young are those artistically developed records of sin which form the staple of the popular novel 
in these days of disordered nerve centers and commissions to inquire into everything we neglect much valuable information which lies upon the surface it is well to bear in mind that our eminent bibliographer mr spofford has informed us that quote, masses of novels and other ephemeral publications overload most of our public libraries end quote, and that our wisest physicians have agreed as to the influence they exert of course these views will be met by a brusque statement that town libraries must supply such books as people want and that they demand the current novels in unlimited quantities but i repudiate the dismal fallacy upon which such an argument is based plum cake and champagne would doubtless be demanded at the sunday school picnic were these delicacies placed upon the table but if the committee did not think it necessary to supply them from the parish funds is it certain that a fair amount of cold beef and hasty pudding would not be consumed in their stead and if a heartless man-government declined to furnish maggie and molly with the pirate's penance or the bridge's bigamy for their sabbath reading is it not possible that those fair voters of the future might substitute mrs fawcett's interesting illustrations of political economy or some outline of human physiology their knowledge of which would bless an unborn generation i do not advocate the absurdity of a town library which should chiefly consist of authors like plato and professor pierce no one can doubt that the great majority of its volumes should be emphatically popular in their character they should furnish intelligible and interesting reading to the average graduate of the town schools and there is no lack of such works the outlines of physical and social science have been written by men of genius in simple and attractive style history and biography in the hands of their masters gives a healthy stimulus to the imagination and tend to strengthen the character the function of a town library should be to supply reading improving and interesting and yet in the best sense of the word popular and i maintain that this can be done without setting up a rival agency to the newsstand the book club and the weekly paper for the circulation of the novels of the day there is a saying of dr johnson to the effect that if a boy be let loose in the library he is likely to give himself a very fair education but in accepting this dictum we must remember the sort of library the doctor had in his mind as known to him it was based upon solid volumes of systematized information besides these were the noblest poems of the world a very few great romances and ponderous tomes of controversial theology good healthy food and much of it attractive to an unpampered boy appetite but the range of a large library is by no means necessary to produce the soundest educational results can it be doubted that familiar knowledge of a small case of well-selected books such for instance as the modest stipend of a country clergyman easily collects is better for boy and girl than the liberty of devouring a thousand highly flavored sweets in the free library at all events a few old-fashioned people do not question it a year ago writes one of them alice used to read irving and spencer and tom was dipping into gibbon and shakespeare liking them well enough yet preferring a game of baseball to either as it was proper he should but the town library was opened and these young people are found crouching over novels in out-of-the-way corners when they ought to be at play or reading surreptitiously at night when they ought to be asleep end quote it is in vain to throw all the responsibilities upon parents american parents are very busy and somewhat careless miss fanny firefly's highly seasoned love stories for girls and mr samuel's sensations boy novels and spiced preparations of boned history are got up like the port wine drops of the confectioners to tempt and to sell and they do their work no one can examine the average boy and girl of the period without being struck with their ignorance of the great works of english literature which young people of a former generation were accustomed to read with profit and delight the function of a town library is to supplement the town schools to gratify the taste for knowledge which they should have imparted and to serve as an instrument for that self-education to which there is no limit 
but taxpayers are not bound to circulate twenty seven thousand novels against nineteen hundred volumes of biography and seventeen hundred of history according to the figures of one report or to expend two-thirds of the workforce of their establishment in sending out novels and juveniles according to the statement of another in a word information not excitement should be imbibed from the atmosphere of the town library that prevailing infirmity of our time which seems to substitute sensibility for morality should there find small encouragement but we shall never know what this institution might do for a community so long as the temptation of free novels is thrust in the faces of all who enter for it is not to be expected that our youth fresh from school moving among the countless agitations of american life will select reading that may require some mental exertion so long as mental excitement is offered to them in unlimited amounts i am well aware how much may be said for the story-tellers and how many people there are to say it and whenever there is danger of their being unduly neglected my voice shall be loudly raised in their behalf but one may allow the claim of the romances from scheherazade to mrs southworth and yet maintain that the theory upon which the average town library is run is faulty there is no virtue in despising cakes and ale and the heat of ginger in the mouth may at times impart a wholesome glow to the entire system but it does not quite follow that it is the function of american towns to supply these stimulants gratis at the expense of their taxpayers while we consider the immense amount of reading of a certain sort that a town library supplies it is well to remember that there are other sorts of reading it may possibly prevent for it may encourage reading precisely as prodigality encourages industry luxury and profusion do indeed feed industry and demoralize it but the industry which serves god by blessing man they prevent from being fed i fear that in these days more noble capacities die of a surfeit from too much poor reading than starve from want of good books the valid defense of institutions working in the interest of state education is this they prevent a waste of power when any one of them can be shown to encourage waste of power it needs looking after in our complex social condition the real consequences of any government interference extend far beyond its apparent consequences an institution may be very useful up to a certain point and yet hurtful if allowed to run its full course without restraining criticism the managers of our smaller libraries are apt to be picked men who give unrequited labor and intelligence to their trust but they are chosen at town meetings and to a certain extent must carry out the wishes of their electors upon this matter as upon most others it is the duty of the thoughtful men and women to create a wholesome public opinion they must recognize the fact that the change from a few good books to an unlimited supply of all sorts of books is by no means an unmixed advantage to the community while the results of town libraries taken in the aggregate are undoubtedly good it is our duty to consider whether they ought not to be better End of section 22, The Function of a Town Library. Section 23 of Why Do We Need a Public Library by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrar. Section 23. The Library and the Social Center by Ludi Eugenia Stearns. By a great expert in library field work, as done by one of our most active library commissions, Miss Ludi E. Stearns, of whom a sketch will be found in Volume One of this series, is now a lecturer at large. But at the writing of this paper, which is reprinted from the Wisconsin Library Bulletin for May 1911 she was in the service of the library commission of that state it is coming to be an axiom in library economy that the worth of a book is in its use for this reason librarians everywhere are devoting themselves to what is called library extension 
through the building of branches and the establishment of deposit stations in schools factories stores clubhouses police stations fire engine houses etc experience has shown that where no efforts are made along the line of library extension only ten per cent or at the most twenty per cent of the people are reached in any given community if we wish to have wholesome literature become the burden of the common thought we must place good books within easy reach of all libraries should be quick to realize that the social center offers a most excellent opportunity to reach those that might not otherwise take the time to avail themselves of library privileges the free public library should therefore be made an important part of social center work through active and sympathetic cooperation where libraries can afford proper facilities there is no reason why the library building should not serve as the social center for the community as this institution differs from the schoolhouse in cities where parochial schools exist in being neutral on the religious question and therefore acceptable to all denominations wherever the social center may be whether in library building or schoolhouse strong emphasis should be placed on the use of books a special librarian of peculiar fitness should be appointed either by the library or the social center authorities this man or woman should be earnestly altruistic in his or her desire to fit the right book to the right person at the right time it may be that this will mean the issuance of a primer in english to an adult slob who has recently arrived in this country or it may be the loan of a novel more wholesome in tone though just as sentimental as one by bertha m clay the author requested again the leader of the boy gang may be persuaded to give up the reading of the lurid nickel library in favor of custer and reynolds truthful indian experiences such selection involves a wide range of books in the social center library from well-bound and attractive editions of the classics down to the latest most wholesome novel the boys that frequent the gymnasium may be won by barber's latest football story the raffia worker should find interest in priestman's handicrafts an up-to-date and authoritative encyclopedia a good dictionary a world almanac and other popular reference books should be supplied and instruction given in their use debating material should be sought and every inducement offered for individual research those who cannot afford to take correspondence courses in the various trades and crafts should find material in the social center library for self-education james russell lowe has said that the best part of every man's education is that which he gives himself and it is for this that the library at the social center should furnish the opportunity and the means again there should be books of a cheerful sort for tired workers so that as in william morris's earthly paradise they may forget six counties overhung with smoke forget the snorting steam and piston stroke wholesome novels should be found in plenty from both men and women together with books that inspire with courage for life's daily round such as hugh black's work gannett's blessed be drudgery hyde's art of optimism emerson's character and heroism and wagner's courage each book in the library's collection should serve one or all three purposes to inform to inspire or to refresh the rules for the issuance of books should be made as simple as possible borrowers should not be restricted to one book at a time if more can be used that is a novel should be loaned with a book for study no guarantee should be required except the borrower's signature a reading room should be made an attractive feature in connection with the issuance of books the library and reading room should be well lighted and heated and order and quiet should be insisted upon 
the reading table should be supplied with an abundance of the best of the popular magazines the technical world popular mechanics amateur work and the scientific american will be found to be strong magnets for attracting the interests of the boys and young men the world's work collier's weekly and the american magazine are the three great exponents of optimism in our national life which should find a place on the reading-room tables as should mcclure's everybody's hampton's scribner's harper's century and the atlantic in the small towns the local paper and one or two of the nearby metropolitan dailies should also be taken attractive libraries and reading rooms make less attractive the seductions of other places george eliot said long ago important as it is to direct the industries of men it is not so important as to wisely direct their leisure it is indeed true as a critic of our national life has said that the use of a nation's leisure is the test of its civilization to win people to a love of good literature to bring back the old days of reading and meditation are two of the great problems that confront the present-day librarian in the words of one earnest library worker the modern library movement is a movement to increase by every possible means the accessibility of books to stimulate their reading and to create a demand for the best its motive is helpfulness its scope instruction and recreation its purpose the enlightenment of all its aspiration still greater usefulness End of section twenty three Section twenty four of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Why Do We Need a Public Library? by Various. How to Use a Library by James Mascarene Hubbard. The substance of two addresses made at Pittsfield, Mass and printed in the library journal for february eighteen eighty four mr hubbard's advice with regard to children's reading was followed long ago by specialization in work with children that with regard to adult fiction remains unheeded some day possibly we shall have adults librarians and training for work with adults james mascarene hubbard was born in boston in eighteen thirty six he was made assistant librarian of the boston public library in eighteen eighty four and also reorganized the berkshire athenaeum of pittsfield mass in the same year among all the pictures of abraham lincoln none perhaps are more interesting than two which represent scenes at the beginning and at the end of his life in the first a lad of thirteen or fourteen he is reading by the light of a fire in his father's log hut in the second, he is reading the Bible to his sons in a room in the White House. This Bible, which lies before the President in the latter picture, with a catechism and a spelling book, were the only books in that frontier cabin when he learned to read. Though his father could neither read nor write, yet he took the greatest interest in getting books for his son, so that when he was eighteen, his library consisted of the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, Aesop's Fables, Weems and Ramsey's Lives of Washington, a life of clay, the autobiography of Franklin, and a copy of Plutarch. It is noteworthy that the one which influenced him the most strongly, after the Bible, was the life of Washington. At the very crisis of his career, when on his way to the national capital, to take the leading part in crushing out the rebellion, he reverted to those early days, and recalled the burning thoughts which filled his mind while reading of the sufferings and sacrifices endured for the sake of freedom by the great patriot leader and his followers. Lincoln's experience was, of course, no solitary one, but it doubtless had a great effect when it became generally known. It filled many men's imaginations with pictures of obscure lads with latent powers for noble deeds, in danger of being stunted or wholly destroyed for want of proper nourishment, and they gave freely and generously that these village Hamptons, these hearts, pregnant with sacred fire, might not live useless and ignoble lives for want of books alone. 
Hence today, a large section of our country is dotted over with libraries, in which the collective wisdom and experience of the world, as it were, are gathered for the use, especially of the youth of the nation. But, as is inevitable with the blessing of abundance, has come its danger also. Lincoln's naturally great intellectual powers were strengthened by their being at first exercised upon a few subjects. The possession of a book, being an era in his early life from its rarity, he read and re-read each one which he got, so as almost to learn it by heart before he read another. So the vivid impressions received from the lives of Washington and the other great heroes of history ran no risk of being dissipated before they could have their full effect upon his mind and heart. This, however, is our danger, in this day of public libraries and cheap literature, that the mental strength of our youth will be weakened through the too much reading of a multitude of books. As the waters of a brook, when confined to a narrow channel, may have power enough to set in motion a thousand spindles, but, if suffered to spread over the ground, are not able to turn a child's toy wheel, so with the powers of the mind. When directed to a few objects, they may be capable of the greatest and most beneficent results, but when allowed to exhaust themselves upon a multitude, they are in danger of becoming sterile and unfruitful. With Lincoln, then, and with many a frontier and backwoods boy now, the question was and is, how shall I get a book? With a greater number today, however, the more important question is, which book shall I choose? Before attempting to aid anyone to answer this question for himself, let me briefly advert to the fact that there are two kinds of reading for each of us, and two corresponding uses, therefore, of the library, the reading for amusement and the reading for profit. In regard to the former I can say but a word, as it is a subject by itself, and that word is, let this reading be the best possible, and do not let it occupy too much of your spare time. Books read simply for amusement have on most a greater power to elevate or degrade than any others, and more care should be taken in selecting them than in the choice of those to be read for instruction. Read, then, and put into the hands of the young the best fiction, and shun those writers, whatever their power or their popularity, who reproduce in their books the slang and vulgar speech of the streets, and paint realistic scenes of vice and crime. The answer to the question, how or what shall I read, must necessarily be as varied as the tastes, the talents, and the circumstances of readers vary. The general aim, however, should be the same in all. We should read, in order to do well, whatever we have to do in life. Now this implies something more than the reading simply to increase one's knowledge, certainly a worthy aim, but not the highest. The field of knowledge is so broad, and the time for reading so short, that we must necessarily choose those subjects the knowledge of which will make us better fitted for our work in life. And the mere seeking for knowledge, which is the sole end of much reading, does not imply, but may even prevent, the attaining that higher end, the cultivation of our nobler powers, as the imagination and the sympathies, and the gaining the power of appreciating what is highest and best in literature and life. For instance, one may be conscious of a total lack of love for any great writer. To him, Homer, Dante, Shakespeare, Milton, and their peers are but names. Now it may be that the best use to which such an one can put a library is to make at least the attempt to understand and enjoy some great author. It will be no easy task, but one needing and worthy the hardest study. To take, as an illustration of one method, a lesser poet, read carefully and thoughtfully Matthew Arnold's introduction to his edition of the selected poems of Wordsworth. Whenever he refers to a poem, read it before going farther, and re-read it until the thought of the poet as indicated by the commentator is reasonably clear. Then read, in the same manner, what Coleridge, Sharp, F. W. Robertson, or any other good critic has written upon Wordsworth. And above all, sometimes read the poems as nearly as possible in the same circumstances under which they were written, in the forest, by the brookside, in the solitudes of the mountains, or on a bridge in the heart of a great city. If this fail to awaken an interest in Wordsworth, try some other author in a similar way, and it is impossible that of all who have stirred men's hearts through the ages, no one can be found to arouse your sympathies. And when the right author is at length found, you live on a higher plane than before. This great poet, philosopher, or dramatist has become your friend and familiar companion, a gain far greater than the acquirement of any mere book knowledge. 
the greater part of another person's life may be spent in sordid surroundings with companions and in an occupation tending to depress and degrade the better nature i can easily conceive that it might be the highest duty of such an one to remain ignorant of much useful knowledge in order to quicken the imagination to enlarge the tastes and heighten the enjoyments so that when the day's work is done he may exchange the sordid companions suggestive only of mean thoughts and low aims for intercourse with men of purest and noblest nature men too it may be who have lived thought and written under circumstances as depressing as those in which he lives and works so there may be some one who regretfully feels that in nature there is nothing which gives to him as to others the keenest pleasure refreshing him when wearied encouraging him when downcast who sees nothing in the skies save signs of the coming storm nothing in the trees or flowers the rivers or the hills save something relating to his material comfort or discomfort the best use to which this man could put a library and his reading hours might be to study the works of the great interpreters of nature as white of selborne ruskin or emerson and if they should open his eyes so that he can look through nature up to nature's god his gain is immeasurable now in neither of these instances is the increase of knowledge the aim set before the reader but the development of some dwarfed faculty whose growth is necessary to the leading of a noble life but where the increase of knowledge is the direct end sought the value of the knowledge in itself must not be that alone which decides one in the choice of books or incites him to reading but the use to which it can and ought to be put an employer of labor for instance one who is immediately responsible for the welfare of a large number of workmen cannot with any true conception of his duty as a master devote his time for reading to acquiring a knowledge of history science or literature if he know nothing of the principles underlying the relations of capital to labor if he is ignorant of the dangers the temptations the needs and rights of his workpeople however well informed on other subjects he has read to far less advantage than if his books had been chosen with a direct purpose to fit him to do his duty as a master so many a parent ought for a time at least to read with a view wholly to prepare himself for the wise moral and mental training of his children and on the other hand a man should read the history of his country not merely that he may not blush from conscious ignorance of it but that knowing what his heritage of freedom cost to obtain he may also come to the conviction that it is not his to enjoy simply but it is a sacred trust to be accounted for however humble his position it could not be more humble than lincoln's and yet none can doubt that to the spirit in which he read american history was largely due his future fitness for the great work which god gave him to do to what highest and most profitable use can i put my reading is the question then which each one should ask himself and according as the answer is so should the choice be made it may be that one will read that he may understand better his duties and privileges as a citizen another that he may be a just master or an intelligent and faithful workman still another that she may be a wise parent while a fourth may have the strong conviction that everything else should be laid aside for the study of one of the masterpieces of the world's literature, that he may develop his higher faculties and become a man thinking lofty thoughts and capable of noble deeds. But there is a very large class of readers, especially of a public library, to whom what I have just said will be of but little use. And as it is upon them that the choice of books has the greatest influence for good or evil, it is to speak of their interests that I turn with the deepest solicitude. This class may be subdivided into two classes, the children of unintelligent parents, who are capable of directing their reading, and those children who have none to guide them in their choice. As regards the former, one of the greatest dangers of the public library, in my opinion, is that many parents throw off all responsibility as to the books their children read upon those who have charge of the library. A generation ago, all the books, as a rule, which the young read, were bought especially for them by their parents or friends, with more or less care in the selection. Of course, under these circumstances they had a general knowledge of what their children read. Now a great many parents neither know, nor do they apparently seem to care to know, what books fall into their children's hands, so long as they are from the public library, which is supposed to be a guarantee for their fitness for young readers. 
without entering here upon the important question as to what books should or should not be put in a public library it is enough to say that no intelligent parent with a right idea of his duty toward his children can properly lay this responsibility upon persons however carefully chosen or however faithful in the discharge of their duties the capacity of children for receiving good or bad impressions from books differs as their features and forms vary the same story might prove harmless to one boy and give a moral twist to another's mind from which he might never recover one girl might receive from a book a hundred evil suggestions hopelessly depraving her imagination while upon another it might not leave a single evil trace now it is not possible for the most scrupulous librarian to discriminate between these two and refuse the book to the one and freely give it to the other and therefore no library with a large and miscellaneous collection of stories and novels can be safe for children freely to use except under the careful supervision of their parents the only safeguard of which i know is for parents to read much with their children to interest themselves in their books and to talk with them about them those stories for instance against which there has been such an outcry of late years would have but small power to hurt that boy to whom a father had taken the pains to point out the absurdities the unrealities the false ideas and aims of which they are accused but in our cities and large towns there can be no doubt that the greater number of the younger readers of a public library belong to the second of the two classes referred to those who have none to guide them in the choice of their books the most of these come of course simply for amusement without a thought of any better use of the library but a few come with other and higher aims some with no specially strong tastes or more than ordinary capacities merely wish to read that which will cultivate their minds and increase their knowledge or will be profitable to them in their work a very few there are however in every large town with intellects of no mean order and strong ambitions who turn to the library instinctively for that which will satisfy the cravings of their intellects and the promptings of their ambitions a youth with the instincts of a lincoln or a webster comes to read the history of his country another with the latent powers of a naismith a stevenson or an arkwright wants the books which will give full play to his inventive faculties another finds a strange and irresistible attraction in natural phenomena in the habits of plants and animals in the formation of the rocks and the hills in the aspects of the skies and the movements of the stars now it will depend very much upon the first choice of their books and the subsequent direction of their reading whether they will become men useful to the communities in which they live and add substantial material to the sum of human knowledge as statesmen inventors naturalists or astronomers the danger is that for lack of proper guidance and restraint they will dissipate their mental energies and lose sight of all high aims by too much and too vague reading if the public library is to be in fact what it is in theory an educating power second only to the church and the school and supplementing the work of both there must be some method devised by which such readers as these may be helped to choose the right books without such aid given continually and systematically the library fails in the principal end for which it was founded the elevation and instruction of the people we might as well turn our children into a schoolhouse fully furnished with books and apparatus but with only a janitor to see that no injury is done to them and expect the children to make a wise use of their opportunities to take up and pursue the proper studies without the aid of a master as to give children the free range of a great library and expect them undirected to make a wise use of its advantages as a means of education it is therefore in my opinion a most pernicious error to encourage young people of the lower classes especially to come to a library and to give them poor stories in the mistaken belief that the taste for reading being developed they will naturally and surely rise from these to better books such a belief is contrary to all our experience of human nature with careful guidance and restraint a boy may be brought from the dime novel to read scott and macaulay but without this restraint and guidance where one will rise a hundred a thousand rather will remain at the level from which they started or more naturally sink to still lower depths the question is can anything be done to help the young who throng our public libraries to read well and wisely shall these boys and girls with their unknown powers both for good and evil be left to grope helplessly amid these treasures of wisdom and knowledge which our libraries contain or shall the attempt at least be made to give them a kindly and intelligent guidance 
this work of such incalculable importance i hasten to say is already well done to a certain extent by a few librarians in the country but it is a work which requires time patience tact and insight into character and a very varied and extensive knowledge it is evident that the librarians who combine these requisites are few in number it is a work which cannot be done by them as a class nor can it be done by the ordinary catalogues however skilfully prepared for it is evident that there needs to be some personal knowledge of each reader's capacities in order to help him intelligently and profitably nor is it something which the school teachers willing though many of them are can do except in a limited degree as many of those who need help are not school children there are however a few persons in every town fitted by their education and their circumstances in life for this work and it is to them we must finally appeal the most practical plan presenting on the whole the fewest difficulties seems to be the following let those persons who are willing to make the attempt to give this instruction in reading choose each a subject as general history the history of the united states science travels biography fiction or children's stories and see what their public library contains on these subjects in due time notice could be given that all persons wishing help in the choice of books in any of these subjects could be aided by applying to the librarian he would refer the inquirer to that person who has chosen this subject who will naturally endeavor to find out something of the character circumstances and abilities of the applicant before selecting the books best fitted in his or her opinion for him to read no doubt at first there would be a few to apply and mistakes would be made from lack of experience but if only one reader was substantially aided if only one bright youth was rescued from the danger of dissipating his energies by aimless or depraving reading all the labor would be amply rewarded to say nothing of the benefit which the guide himself in preparing for his work would receive i do not believe however that the applicants for guidance would be few when it was known among the work people of our mills our shops and stores among the poor that every one coming to the library asking for aid would find some one ready as it were to take him by the hand and lead him from book to book so long as he needed help i am confident that it would be an invaluable service if some one or two persons should take the pains to become acquainted with the character of the books for the children and the novels contained in the library there are many parents who feel instinctively the truth of the words of f w robertson that a man's character and mind are moulded for good or evil far more by the forms of imagination which surround his childhood than by any subsequent scientific training many an anxious but ignorant parent who sees in her boys and girls a craving for books at which she rejoices with trembling would turn with heartfelt gratitude i speak with the fullest confidence because i speak from experience to one who would give them advice as to the books which their children might safely read and those which they should shun it is only by some such means as this that the public library can be made a real educating power for the masses in far too many places now it is simply a place where children can get story-books at the public expense this cannot long continue and i believe that the great part of the libraries which continue to do this work without an effort to fulfil their higher mission will surely and inevitably die as the district school and agricultural libraries died fifty years ago the responsibility rests with the people of each place where there is a public library as to which of two ends shall be reached it may be merely a means for furnishing amusement for an hour or it may be a central beacon from whence the rays of light shall stream into every house end of section twenty four Section 25 of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Why Do We Need a Public Library? By Various. Section 25 Where Neighbors Meet by Marjorie Closey Quigley. Extracts from a special report on the social work of the St. Louis Public Library, made in 1917 by Marjorie Quigley, then librarian of its Duval branch. Marjorie Closey Quigley was born in Los Angeles, California, September 16, 1886, and graduated from Vassar College. 
she entered the service of the st louis public library in february 1909 studied at the new york state library school in 1914-15 and in August 1918 became librarian of the Free Library in Endicott, New York. The experience of the St. Louis Public Library goes to prove that no matter what the neighborhood may be, and however well supplied it already is with meeting places, there is always room for the library auditorium and club rooms, without subtracting in any way from the business of the other agencies. In fact, they seem to increase each other's use. Of our six branch buildings, one is located in the heart of the older ghetto, one in Carondelet, two in purely residential neighborhoods, one at the Soulard Civic Center, where nine or ten European languages are represented, and the sixth in the older German section on the north side near the river. About each branch is the full quota of meeting places required by any given neighborhood, moving picture houses community halls to let for dances and entertainments churches saloons turnverines settlements clubhouses running the gamut from lid clubs to the artists guild masonic temples and public schools which are now managed on the community centre plan several of the branches have all these within a radius of five or six blocks and still they must show the standing-room-only sign to many of the clubs that apply for the use of the library halls. The remarkable feature of this wider use of the library is that, in spite of the increase of meetings, there has been no spirit of competition. Between the community halls and the library, for example, there has been no rivalry for statistics of use. Caban Branch, in the heart of perfectly equipped institutions, which foster all sorts of clubs, shows more than 52 meetings a month during the last nine months, while our report of 1907 said of this branch, there has been an average of nearly six meetings a month in the building. Neighborhood clubs meet in the halls which best suit their purposes, and no agency seeks to move any one of them to a different roof. In the Crunden branch neighborhood, the socialists meet in a synagogue, and a Yiddish church meets in the library. The City Recreation Department reports that the library's work and the department's community work at the Patrick Henry School and on the playgrounds, far from duplicating one another, are supplementary. In giving the free use of its meeting rooms to any reputable group of persons, the St. Louis Public Library acts upon two principles which it cannot emphasize strongly enough. They are the same on which it buys its books. First, that the library stands for no propaganda, but seeks to house all opinions. And second, that it makes no obvious attempt at reform or uplift. Although the books it buys must meet a certain standard in style and content, the day is past when library assistants seek to force down readers' throats books which will be good for them. In the same way, the meeting which it shelters must meet the standards of the community, but the library has ceased to initiate or direct clubs and meetings, cultural or otherwise. Community work can be successful only when it embodies the spontaneous expression of the neighborhood's own demand, whether it is from children or women or men. A chain of suffrage groups was successful, if numbers were an indication, in one neighborhood, and a failure in another, from the same cause. In a neighborhood of illiterate foreign women with large families, one suffragist lecturer on the common law of England was greeted by an audience consisting of one deaf old lady and fifty Jewish children under twelve who had heard that candy was to be given away. Many of the meetings that wither and die are conceived in the finest spirit of service. If they aim to interest the whole neighborhood, irrespective of cliques and prejudices, they almost always fail if, as we Americans are supposed to do, we figure failure and success in terms of quantity. Utopian schemes cannot long survive today, housed or not in the scholarly and friendly surroundings of the library. A united Ukraine cannot absorb the attention of its supporters half as continuously as the possibility of a new job in Ford's factory, and a decent dancing club cannot always endure in the face of profits to be made from a river excursion. 
probably of all municipal institutions the library while maintaining its dignified and quiet atmosphere may become the least formal and most neighborly it is a library truism that a librarian can tell from repeated experiences just when a borrower is calling at the library to announce her engagement or to proclaim that his new job has been secured countless other bits of everyday news are exchanged over the desk with real profit to the library and to the visitor we feel in st louis that the so-called wider use of the plant is only a tangible expression of this same friendly relationship justified on the one hand by its economy and on the other and to a far larger extent by its contribution to the community's legitimate social life very fortunately for the taxpayer and for the average reader the public library does not look upon its branches as intellectual clinics for the poor like the public schools its problem is to serve all the children of all the people and consequently in localities other than those where foreigners live the same sort of branch building is erected with an auditorium open under the same regulations and used to meet the needs of the particular neighborhood the so-called middle class has as fair a chance and as good a time in the library auditoriums as the foreign poor when there are public meetings at the carondelet library speakers from other parts of the city invariably come late they begin their addresses with long apologies saying that they have never been in this neighborhood before and did not know where to find the library they always seem amazed at the size and beauty of the building and comment particularly on the pleasant club rooms one west end woman could not say enough in praise of everything continually repeating and all this down here practically this same comment is made again and again in the main library and in the other branches throughout the city all this down here is equally true of seven auditoriums each with a seating capacity of two hundred and of club rooms and offices to the number of fifteen in these halls were held during the past year practically as large a number of meetings as our equipment would permit omitting the meetings at crundon and soulard practically all are held by the average sort of person average financially socially and intellectually the very absence of a feeling that the club must make money or must at least pay its expenses probably accounts for the long list of small clubs and board meetings which could almost as easily meet in the homes of the members there are those who think that no one uses the auditoriums except very wealthy club women who set up christmas trees for the poor there is no more truth in this than there would be in saying that all the inhabitants of st louis are either immigrants or millionaires in the total number of meetings at the library what ida tarbell has termed the shirtwaist crowd is by far in the majority at practically every branch the simon pure women's clubs form at least fifteen per cent of all the meetings at the caban branch about fifty per cent are made up of women the bar branch mother's circle the queen hedwig polish women and the carondelet women's club are three names out of a list running almost to a hundred the masculine of the shirtwaist crowd is the shirt sleeves crowd and this is equally well represented upon the schedules of all the branches miss griggs of the bar branch writes we seem now to have a number of new meetings that are held for discussion but not many for study casual one meeting only affairs for instance the royal arcanum met to discuss what could be done about the increased rates all the premiums were raised and those for older men were raised far out of reason so all the older members had a meeting down here to discuss what action they could take i'm glad people come casually that way and feel that we are open for something besides the regular study meetings they sit around very informally smoke come in and out downstairs and do not have any very formal session in common with the other branches barr has had political meetings some have been held just before elections and have been quite warm on one occasion the library was made a buzzing community centre by a series of bombs that were set off in the street other and quieter meetings have been held by party committees judges of elections and the like the state socialist party has twice held its conventions here and each time the session lasted for four days 
the meetings were opened with hymns and the delegates had all-day sessions from nine a m to nine p m i think most of the partisan leaders feel that they are a little handicapped when they meet in the library still they come back occasionally there are coming to be more purely social meetings of younger grade pupils in some cases these children are not organized but merely claim to be in order to get the halls in other cases relatives who come with them to make application are frank to confess that they want the hall to avoid the inconvenience at home especially the protracted house cleanings which are the prerequisite of most home parties one mother said that the last time there was a birthday party in her house the man who lived upstairs after rapping repeatedly on the floor to stop the children's noise came down and said that the party would simply have to bust up she wanted to hold this party in the library because her husband had such a bad temper that she was sure he would murder the man if such a thing happened again and of course it would happen again for no children's party would ever be quiet enough to suit that man upstairs adult clubs as a whole ask very little of us beyond the occasional use of the telephone and they often come and go without our being conscious of them this is especially true of daytime meetings it must be admitted that in addition to those who are very friendly and those who do not make either criticism or appreciation articulate there are some who break the monotony of the librarian's existence by thinking they owns the place to quote the janitor the younger social meetings need considerable attention too they overflow upstairs and are always noisy and sometimes not as agreeable as they should be a member of a new club of girls said i guess we rented this building for the evening we can make as much noise as we please within certain limits particularly the powder cans and lead pencils of the staff we want the clubs to think that they do own the place the surest proof that the st louis plan works is to have the scions of our democracy feel that they are getting their money's worth from the institution that their taxes support a group of young socialists was formed too late in the season to secure a regular meeting night they finally decided that they would have to be satisfied with meeting for the winter at Kay's delicatessen store a few blocks away Kay's has an advertisement every week in the jewish record inviting men to come and read the papers there and make use of their free meeting room like all jewish delicatessens this shop contains everything that any patron is willing to buy and in addition elaborates the coffee-house idea into any shape that circumstances may suggest when the young men said individually on later occasions that they were not contented at the delicatessen they always added it's because we feel so at home in the library because we've always gotten our books out there the next winter their application was handed in several months in advance in a neighborhood where conditions are the exact antithesis of crundon's the same feeling exists miss pretlow was talking one evening to a young man who belonged to a group giving a dancing party at caban library she said that she could not but remark how well-dressed and well-bred and altogether prosperous the dancers were they very evidently could have met in any one of a number of large homes or could have paid for one of the best halls in the city so she said to the young man how is it you did not rent blank's hall but use the library instead i know it can't be the difference in cost that influences you the young man answered in very evident astonishment why we like this place we all grew up in this library when adolescents of both sexes meet together their meetings are purely for a good time their behavior is extremely immature from the social side either very wooden or very uncontrolled this is the period when the librarian must insist upon strict chaperonage and it is also the period when resentment of discipline or even of suggestion runs high they would no more follow the advice of the librarian in the matter of invitations introduction of wallflowers or how a dance is to be run off generally than they would copy her taste in dress which they invariably consider very old maidy the standards to which social clubs adhere rigidly are those observed in places of commercialized amusement one group of boys met to teach each other dancing where the girls would not see them as it was a case of the blind leading the blind a volunteer who had been teaching folk dancing to the girls all winter offered her services 
After one trial she was persona non grata because she wouldn't let them rag. Some of the dances are quite grim. One will not hear a note of laughter all evening. Five or six girls will often come together. Those who know boys will dance with them, and between dances they will not make the slightest effort to introduce their friends to possible partners. The friends, instead of resenting this inactivity, often sit all evening on the sidelines watching and chewing gum, apparently perfectly satisfied. At the opposite pole is the wild desire for roughhouse, in the early stages of auditorium work, and before these days of H.C.L., pieces of cake have occasionally gone flying across the hall. As soon as branch libraries recognized these facts, and it was very soon, the application for dances became fewer and of better quality. Leavings from other club rooms no longer apply, and disgruntled alumni associations in schools have ceased to contemplate a move to the nearest branch library. No effort has been made to advertise the club rooms, beyond the statements of the branch librarians in passing, except the exhibiting of the rooms themselves to visitors who stop in to show our library to Cousin Sarah from Davenport, or Illinois, or Oklahoma, as the case may be. Word-of-mouth publicity accounts for the gradual steady growth in the use of the club rooms. One of the many examples began with a stenographer, who sewed, in secret, as she said, at noon in the club room. She was embroidering an engagement present for one of the girls in her office. Needless to say, she scattered information about the rooms and the rules governing their use whenever anyone would listen. Eventually a Sunday school class, to which her cousin belonged, gave a St. Patrick's Day party in the library. As an indirect result, a school patrons' association— now holds five or six meetings every spring to make preparations for its annual picnic. So the ball of publicity rolls along of its own momentum. At branch libraries, the auditorium and study rooms are, as a rule, closely connected architecturally with the reading rooms, and club members usually pass through the main part of the library to reach their meetings. One or two, at least, from each group stop to chat with the workers or to read, at Crundon, the assistants say that whenever a Yiddish meeting is to begin at nine, the men come at eight and read. Then there are the isolated individuals from a club who stumble on the resources of the library quite by accident and later grow communicative. Occasionally someone rushes upstairs to borrow the telephone book, and when, after an unsuccessful quest, he is offered the city directory by the librarian, he finds it hard to realize that any library can contain a book as useful as that. One man who saw a magazine lying on the desk, while he was asking to be directed to the auditorium, said, I had no idea the library handled magazines. Libraries try as faithfully to reach everyone as if they were commercial enterprises, but there will always be a certain number of persons who have never been in a library building, not to speak of knowing the location of the nearest branch and realizing its resources. A Harvard graduate said he had walked past a branch every day for a year and had thought it was the branch post office. If there were no other arguments in favor of adding auditoriums to the library's list of activities, there is this, that they introduce into the library large groups of people who have had no connection with it before. The horse has at least been led to the water. If clubs meet regularly, there is always a small proportion who make meeting night their library night. They consequently read and want to calculate all fines with reference to the night of their last meeting. I once heard one young woman telling another how she finally had her reading doped out into a system. By beginning on her seven-day book just as soon as she reached home after the meeting, and using the fourteen-day book only on the streetcars, with the establishment of libraries in small towns and rural communities, there is at present a tendency to make social centers out of library buildings, even at the sacrifice of the books, rather than to establish libraries in connection with social activities. This is also true in those cities where field houses in parks are well developed. Without holding a brief for either school, we may properly emphasize three principles— the first is that a librarian holds her position by virtue of being a librarian, and that her duty and training require her full time for the purpose for which she is employed, the fitting of the proper book to the individual. 
the second is that if the community needs to have the social center stressed more than the books a social worker must direct the center and the librarian must contribute in a subordinate capacity to make the center a success for example the st louis public library has equipped a room with books and is furnishing an attendant at a colored social center in a church building at garrison and lucas avenues but it does not thereby put forward any claim to control and stimulate the social activities of that neighborhood the third principle is that if the library plant is already in operation it is a waste to exclude neighborhood groups from rooms that are not being used directly for the reading and circulation of books inasmuch as overhead expenses continue end of section twenty five recording by maria casper